Hello. Our story begins in the void. Skywalker was talking to a combination of people. He was trying to figure out what or where he was. None of this made any sense to him, but he was speaking about something tragic. He didn't really know exactly what it was, but it was something. He could hear Obi-Wan tell him something wise, but in a way it came off as neglectful of his feelings. Skywalker continued forward under massive pillars, ones that felt like the interior of the Jedi Temple. He looked from side to side, and then he turned to someone he knew all too well. It was Ahsoka. She was looking at him and asking him why he could let this happen. He told her he did everything, and she shook her head, telling him that she was in trouble and she needed his help. If he didn't let her go at the top of the temple steps, then she wouldn't be in this position. She let out a terrible scream of agony before silence filled his mind, and he popped up in his bedroom inside the Jedi Temple. Anakin looked around. It was still nighttime on Coruscant. He could tell by the flickering lights in the distance. It provided a peaceful ambience. It was the only thing that gave him comfort when he was just a boy inside the temple after he left his mother. Anakin then came back from the dream, or the nightmare. What did it mean? Was Ahsoka actually in danger? His mind went from calm to disarray. If she was in danger, what did it mean? Did Dooku have her? Did something happen to her here on Coruscant? What could it all mean? He didn't know. Anakin jumped up and grabbed a robe and threw it over his shoulders. There was still a plaguing thought at the back of his mind. Was it his fault that Ahsoka left? He felt terrible pain over the entire thing, and it had only been about a week. His unit hadn't been dispatched to the front lines yet, and he was just bathing in pain. Padme was a good support, but the rest of the Order seemingly moved on, not just from Ahsoka, but the bombing itself. The war was at the forefront of everyone's minds. Skywalker turned to the door and asked himself where he was going. He knew only one person who could give him information. She had to know. Skywalker ran out of the room and through the eerily silent hallways of the Jedi Temple. When there was no one else around, he felt most powerful. It was such a sensation, like he could take all the power in the temple and make it his own. Skywalker shut those thoughts from his mind. It was weird. Every time he snuck out or he walked through the hallways that were barren, he just felt like an impenetrable fortress, like there was nothing that could stop him. What a sick reality that it could potentially become. Anakin hopped into a starship and departed for the lower levels of the city. If he could find Ventress once, he could certainly do it again. Skywalker searched for hours. He didn't even know if it had been hours, but he was doing it. He knew he could find her, and after what felt like days, he found her rummaging around a bar. She looked annoyed, probably because someone had stolen her lightsabers. Anakin walked over to her seat inside of a booth and asked if that seat was taken. She didn't even look up, not recognizing the presence or the voice. She said it wasn't if there was something that could be earned from their conversation. Anakin said that it depends. When she looked up, she looked very peeved. Not this again. Last time he fought her without her lightsabers and now, she was looking at someone who didn't have the same ferocity as he did the last time they fought. Perhaps this would be different. Skywalker sat down and asked her how she had been. Surprising. She said that she was alright and asked what he wanted. He said that Ahsoka left the Order and he feared that Dooku may have captured her. Asajj said that not even Dooku would do that. It wouldn't be worth his time. Anakin disregarded her statement and told her that he could care now. If Dooku was trying to get to him, Ahsoka could be the best way to do it. That was a fair point, but she didn't really care truthfully. What was she supposed to do? Anakin told her that they could get Dooku together. She could get her revenge and he could find his former student. Asajj rolled her eyes. It wasn't that easy. They couldn't just waltz on down to Serena or wherever Dooku was and just expect to beat him. She expressed that she'd be willing to make a deal and perhaps she could find out where Ahsoka was. Anakin was listening and Asajj said that she could spend some time trying to get information from her contacts within the Separatists. They might be able to pick up some rumors or truths about Ahsoka if she was even there. However, it was going to cost him. Asajj wanted supplies for every piece of information he gave her and she wanted her lightsabers back. He told her that he could meet her halfway on that. She wanted to know why. But Anakin simply said, according to the Chancellor, Barris was given Ahsoka's sentence. She was executed. The lightsabers were given to the Council where they were purified, and then they placed in the rest. Asajj gritted her teeth. The Council and the morals always bothered her, but so be it. How about this? He needed a frontier credits for a new lightsaber on the black market. Truthfully, she didn't need it. Asajj had done fine for herself as a bounty hunter but she wanted to see what she could get away with, and get an idea of how desperate Anakin was. Without a second of hesitation, he dropped credits onto the table and she smiled, handing him a communication frequency, telling him that they'd be in contact. 
He looked at her, and she pressed the device further and told him that there was no reason for him to be superstitious. She wanted Dooku dead more than anyone else in the galaxy. He just needed to learn how to trust people. Anakin nodded his head and left. For the following couple months, they would stay in contact with each other, in a manner of which they started developing an actual friendship. Obi-Wan was aware of this little bond that they had, and he kept an eye on it, but he never made a mention against it to Anakin. The Council was well informed on this because of Obi-Wan though. As Anakin and Asajj learned, Ahsoka wasn't ever seen near Dooku or his facilities. Chances are he had a bad dream and overreacted to it. Anakin was appreciative for her work. The two of them now were sitting at the same booth they were before. She was much more relaxed because in the previous few months, she had made a great number of credits off her bounty hunting jobs. She was smooth sailing at this point, and having her new lightsaber made her even deadlier. Ventress told Anakin that she was grateful for the supplies and their alliance, and she wanted to propose an extension to their little truce. He was listening, and she told him that they both wanted Dooku dead, so why not make it happen? Anakin smiled with a bit of a sinister grin. He'd been waiting for this, telling her that it's part of the reason he wanted to meet in person again. Across the room, a Kiflar man was listening to their conversation, as Asajj told Anakin that he needed more work before facing Dooku. He took that as an insult, but she told him to cool his jets. If she thought he was ready, she would be dead by now, but she wasn't, because he couldn't kill her. Despite what he wanted to believe, she was well trained by Dooku, and that experience would be invaluable to their cause. Anakin didn't want to swallow his pride, but she had a point. Asajj was a couple years younger than Obi-Wan, so she had much more time to work with. Plus, out of anyone currently alive, she was the only one who trained under Dooku as a dark sider. She knew what his moves were, and how to counter them. Anakin wanted to know where this was going, and she told him that she was going to take him to Dathomir to teach him how to use the dark side. Anakin slammed his hand on the table. He could not do that. Asajj frowned looking at her drink spill a little bit before turning her eyes to him and calling him a half-witty insult, and telling him that this wasn't going to betray his precious Jedi code. She was going to teach him how to use a dark side of moderation, the way she did. He could go back to being a Jedi once it was done. She thought for a moment and compared it to Mace Windu, but the more dark side focused variation of that. She didn't stay in the light, Anakin actually saw her point. He wasn't above using the dark side, but he didn't like to refer to his outbursts as usage of the dark side. He called it tapping into his full potential or whatever. It was an easier way of saying he didn't want to consider himself a dark side user. He was just using his natural gifts. Asajj told him to meet her at the Banshee. It was at a landing dock not far away from here. She had to gather some supplies before they left. Anakin got up and made his way there, and shortly after, they made their way to Dathomir. Unbeknownst to them, Obi-Wan had been informing the Council of Anakin's new alliance, and they assigned Quinlan Voss to go undercover and trail them. Skywalker wasn't unfamiliar with Voss, because he and Kenobi were friends, but it wasn't like he would recognize him in disguise. Unluckily for Voss, they were going to a planet where he couldn't blend in. When Asajj and Anakin started their training, it was revealed to them that they had been followed, and Quinlan explained his purpose. He did not state that he was sent by the Council. He had been looking for a way to get to Dooku. Rumors had it that he was responsible for his master's death. Asajj backed this up, even though she was the one responsible for killing Master Thulm. She didn't want to create tension between the Jedi and her, which is why she lied. This was meant to be a united force, and they would never get what they wanted if she revealed that she killed his master. The three of them would spend another couple months on Dathomir training. Asajj was watchful over these Jedi as they progressed further into the dark side without ever being enveloped by it. During this time, the men of Anakin's division continued to find success. Obi-Wan informed Rex of everything happening, and he was perfectly content with it. However, for Rex, this meant he was a commander, in the absence of General Skywalker at least. Their unit was still at the top of his game, with very little issues adjusting to his absence. Inversely, the Jedi Council was in a great approval of this mission. They knew the key to victory involved Dooku's death, and they were perfectly content in sanctioning a mission to have him killed. They believed the trio of Ventress, Skywalker, and Voss would be the perfect way to achieve said victory. After months of learning how to use the dark side, Asajj believed they were ready. The benefit of being here with each other is they were able to focus all their time on training. They were specifically training so they could kill one of the most talented duelists of this era. Every waking moment of their days were focused and built around driving a successful effort to wherever Dooku was to kill him. Asajj had been keeping up to date on Dooku's movements and there was confirmation that he was going to be hosting a gala on Raxus. General Grievous would be there too. Quinlan and Anakin knew they'd be ready for this mission. 
By this point, Anakin noticed a deep bond that grew between Asajj and Quinlan. It was very endearing to him, and it made him wonder what it would be like if Padme was Force-sensitive too. Seeing how Quinlan and Asajj's bond grew with such a short period of time was so enchanting to watch. It wasn't ever spoken about, but Anakin could tell simply by the difference between the interactions he had with Asajj and the ones Quinlan had with her. Regardless, the trio was a perfect unit of brute, strength, acrobatic skill, and mastery. They'd be the perfect combination for the likes of Dooku and even Grievous. Asajj had been to the location of the gala before, and she knew what they could do to separate Dooku from Grievous. So when they arrived, Anakin and Quinlan trapped Grievous and went to assist Asajj. It wasn't easy to subdue Grievous, but it was something very similar to a raised shield. They could deal with him together later, after they killed Dooku. That was the whole purpose. They couldn't get to him while he was subdued. Plus, the Count wasn't even wise enough to this trickery. During the gala, Asajj revealed herself to him and promised a one versus one, which he accepted. Ironically, Dooku tried contacting Grievous for reinforcements. He just never responded. This made Dooku assume Ventress had duped the Droid General because she wanted the chance to defeat him in person. Their blades mashed together in the halls. Ventress was using her golden blade, and Dooku taunted her for doing so, calling her weak for going back to the Jedi, then calling her a disappointment for falling so far. But she responded with Venom. He was the one who abandoned her, so much for being more than Sidious could ever dream to be. Even if she died, Sidious would betray him and kill him. This caught him off guard and he was kicked in the face. Anakin and Quinlan came from behind as they engaged the Count as well. He quickly pulled himself together and moved with power. He was so focused on Ventress, but now the fight became one of survival. He blasted the Jedi Master's blades before pairing Anakin and ducking under Ventress. He had done the same exercise with Anakin, Obi-Wan, Asajj, and Savage before. He would do it again here. The only issue is, he was a little older now. But Dooku backed away from the center of their circle. It'd be much more difficult to handle them on his own if they surrounded him. He lunged at them, dispersing them from side to side, and he struck up an engagement with Skywalker. Dooku wanted him dead, and now the thought of killing Anakin felt all the more present in his mind. Who cared about Sidious' precious little chosen one? He could be replaced. It's what he said about Maul and Qui-Gon. No one had permanence. It was a price of peace. Their blades toiled around until the sound of more lightsabers ignited, and the Jedi turned to see Grievous approaching them. They turned back to defend themselves. He was quick on his feet to engage, and Dooku smiled with joy as he sold out Asajj, preparing to enter life. Quillen and Anakin moved to the sides. On Dathomir, they strategized their approach against Grievous. Fisto and Kenobi mastered it, and they would replicate it. Quinlan used a defensive form as Skywalker moved into Form 1 to throw Grievous' targeting off. With Form 1, he struggled due to its various swings, and Skywalker played off that struggle on Grievous. With Quinlan filling the role of Kenobi and Anakin filling the role of Fisto, the two Jedi were able to match every move made by the droid general. What made it better is they didn't need to use the dark side for this. They pushed Grievous back as Asajj got closer and closer to landing a killing blow on Dooku. She slid her blade across his bicep before being struck with electricity and thrown to the ground. Quinlan jumped back, kicking Grievous in the jaw to block an almost lethal strike from Dooku, as Skywalker slashed his blade upwards, cutting through Grievous' abdomen. He panicked and swung all of his blades forward. Skywalker backpedaled, and he could hear Quinlan push Dooku back. He knew this fight was over, and Magna Guards dropped from the ceiling to fight off the Witch and the Jedi as Dooku escaped. It was a torturous end for Grievous. The person who apparently saved him walked out on him. He was left to die alone. Skywalker landed the killing blow before the three of them retreated back to the Banshee and escaped from Raxus. The death of Grievous would be felt galaxy-wide. He was the leader of most operations for the droid army. This meant there was only one real Separatist leader aside from Dooku, which was Admiral Trench. Skywalker and Voss would report the death of Grievous to the Council, which would make its mark inside the Senate. With Grievous dead, they believed that the Chancellor should make a push for the end of the war. This did also benefit the Jedi, as Palpatine was no longer going to be gifted emergency powers. The war seemed closer than ever to being over, and with an elongated confrontation on Anaxis about to burst, it would confirm the death of Admiral Trench. The Republic was closer than ever to winning the war, and the Senate pushed forward another motion to suggest a ceasefire. This wasn't the Republic saying that they were done with the war. The entire purpose of this motion was to send a message to the Separatists to tell them to openly call for a ceasefire and surrender their assets so a peace treaty could begin. But Palpatine was able to wiggle out of such commitment. He had other focuses, and at the top of them, he could not forgo the war. He expressed disappointment in Dooku's failure to keep Grievous alive. The death of Grievous revealed the weakness in the Separatist war machine, and now it was up to Dooku to do something about the failure he created for the Sith. 
Palpatine maintained control over the Senate and shut down their continuous attempts to end the war. He did this through pandering to opposite views and pushing for pride and Republic patriotism. Or another way to rally people together to own the Separatists rather than just end the war. To senators like Rio, Mon, Padme, and Bale, it was clear that this war was no longer about finding peace, at least not for Palpatine. It was about owning the other side, regardless of the effects it could leave behind for the Republic itself. By forcing the war to continue, they could put the Republic at risk for rebellions and uprisings. It was clearer than ever before that they were going to win, but they wanted to avoid any additional collateral damage that could come from Republic victory. The trio that was responsible for this was brought back to Coruscant. There was some animosity between the Jedi and Ventress, but they had to at the very least respect her determination. It may have been for the wrong reasons, but it was helping them win the war. This short meeting was simply to encourage her to continue going forward and using her connections to help them find and defeat Dooku. She admitted that she wasn't doing this for them, she was doing it because no one else would, and she was doing it because Dooku needed to die. They agreed and disagreed with the sentiment. Once she was finished, Voss and Skywalker were questioned on their own motives and how they were handling the emotions and powers of the dark side. The Council knew that Anakin delved into it a little bit, mostly because of Obi-Wan telling them that, but the two Jedi admitted that they were handling it fine. On Dathomir, it was the two of them that kept each other from going too far into one direction. Voss was considered a bit of an outsider for his loose persona, but he was still very much so a Jedi. He was close to the coat, and he was willing to obey it. However, his attachments to Asajj were making that difficult. The Council could sense that there was something going on within the trio. They just didn't know whom. But they wouldn't stop their progress. It resulted in Grievous' death. This did not mean the Council wouldn't keep their eyes on them. As the trio met back up outside the temple, they took the Banshee back to Dathomir so Asajj could continue instructing them. She had every intention of finding and destroying Dooku, but they needed more work. They did well, but they were distracted. They weren't organized, and so, they continued their training together, working harder and more arduously than ever before. Because they had been so successful in their previous attempt, they became closer. The age difference was a little odd for Skywalker, but he was fine with it, even though at this point he was openly third-wheeling. This did lead to some important conversations for Anakin. He knew that Quinlan was harboring emotions for Asajj. He could tell based off the way they looked at each other. He was falling for her relatively quickly, but it was a tender bond. Anakin asked Quinlan if he planned on returning to the Jedi Order after their little endeavor, and he wasn't sure. He was truthfully a Jedi at heart, but the strength of emotional attachments was something he didn't know how to fully feel without being in the Order. Ever since being here on Dathomir, he felt more connected to his true heart. Of course, he had a tremendous bond with his student, Ayla, but he didn't want to think about having to pick or choose between Ayla or Asajj. It wasn't really a choice, but he didn't want to leave the Order. This conversation opened up a dialogue between the three of them because Anakin finally felt comfortable enough to talk about his wife. Asajj was the most surprised by this, but they talked about it over the course of a couple days. Asajj had no intention to force Quinlan to make a decision. She would love him no matter what he decided, and he appreciated that, but it didn't bring Anakin any calmness. He didn't know where to go. He always followed his heart, and being here made the decision feel right. But what else was there for him to do? Asajj and Quinlan believed that if he wanted to stay a Jedi, then he could continue to make that work. But if he thought the life of freedom would present him more opportunities, then that would be the path to take. Skywalker just didn't know, because his relationship was much different than the one unfolding in front of him. Truthfully, part of him was envious of it. Two individuals with a force as attuned as these two were was such a gift. To be with someone that could be a part of you as much as you are a part of them was something they should treasure. They really appreciated his perspective on these things because it was a gift the two of them wouldn't have even considered. Now that they had a chance to consider it, Quinlan especially considered leaving the Jedi Order once they were finished with this mission, something Anakin believed might be the correct decision for him as well. As the end of the war seemed closer and closer to reality, the trio were able to finally reveal that Dooku was on Sereno. He apparently was going to be inside of his castle long enough that they could get there and stop him. The reason it had been so difficult is because he was stationed inside of fleets for the longest time basically bouncing around from blockade to blockade as a means to keep up standards. With this news revealed, they made their way to Sereno. They were unaware that there was also a ship that was following them to the location of Count Dooku. The day they arrived at Castle Sereno, the three of them exited the Banshee and looked at the magnificent structure. Asajj was already on edge. She hated this place. It was where she felt more pain than anywhere else in the galaxy. She'd make sure Dooku paid for what he did to her and all of her sisters. This was going to be a burial ground for this little movement of his. 
As the trio opened the doors to the castle, they looked across and saw two dark figures. Asajj couldn't believe it. Sidious was here. She told the other two to steer clear. It was the Dark Lord of the Sith. Sidious' jaw dropped. He looked at Dooku with disappointment. The entire reason is, is because Dooku informed his master that the trio of Jedi would be coming for him soon. It was told to him that this trio consisted of Kenobi, Windu, and Ventress. The reason Dooku lied is because he planned on Sidious killing Skywalker. If Anakin was out of the picture, then all that remained was a fight between the Sith. Sidious also wouldn't have come if he couldn't kill someone like Kenobi anyways. Dooku had no doubt that he could handle Kenobi or Ventress, but Sidious would handle Windu in this scenario. He was here to make sure Kenobi died. His death would be the key to turning Skywalker to the dark side. So when he realized that he had been lied to, he was fuming. Regardless, lightsabers ignited and the few Jedi moved forward. Sidious turned to Dooku and told him to kill the Jedi. He would watch from afar. This was something Dooku hadn't considered. Sidious would just let him die. However, Quinlan had other plans for this. He launched himself at Sidious and the Dark Lord ignited his blade to defend himself. He threw Quinlan back and attacked. Dooku on the other side of the room blasted forward. He fought with power and precision as Skywalker and Ventress worked in tandem. She could see Quinlan lose his grip and she told Anakin to handle Dooku before breaking off. At this moment, Dooku realized that the key to winning this battle was killing Ventress or Voss. Either of them would make the other crumble, then it would simply be kill Skywalker. But he couldn't expose that until the right time. He needed Sidious to continue getting involved in this fight. As the duels continued across the hall of the castle, two more lightsabers ignited from behind the Jedi. They turned to see two more Jedi running in. It was Masters Kenobi and Blow. They rushed forward as Anakin smiled and doubled back against the Count of Sereno. Kenobi threw himself into Anakin's corner just as Plo joined Asajj and Vaz. It'd be hard for Plo to adjust, but he would. Having fought against Ventress before, he knew how to play with her in his corner. The three of them toiled against the Dark Lord who ignited his second lightsaber to counter it. The Jedi were stuck in a bind as they thrust their blades forward trying to kill Sidious. Obi-Wan and Anakin worked in tandem as they pushed Dooku back. He moved elegantly and he knew he could work this a number of ways, but his main goal at the end of everything was killing Skywalker. He pressed against Anakin before dropping his blade and thrusting forward. His blade clipped Kenobi in the arm before he bent backwards avoiding a crucial strike from Anakin. Kenobi was thrown to the other side of the room with an electric burst. Sidious smiled as he shoved Quillen to the ground before sidestepping and kicking Plo's mask off of his face. The Jedi Master fell to the ground in agony as Asajj stood over him and defended him. She called out Obi-Wan's name and told him to get up now. He looked over and could see Anakin holding his own. He moved to his feet and engaged Sidious. This aided Asajj, but the Dark Lord was dying for a moment like this. He lifted Ventress off the ground with the Force and threw her into the wall, before dragging his blades across the ground and attacking Obi-Wan with all of his strength. Dooku shoved Skywalker over, just in time to watch two lightsabers exit from Obi-Wan's back. Anakin's jaw dropped, and the other three Jedi allies looked over with shame. Plo placed his mask back on and threw his hands forward, pushing Dooku backwards, which saved Anakin from a nearly lethal attack. Plo then called out commands, telling them to move in. Anakin got up and went for the killing blow on Dooku. At the same time, Plo, Ventress, and Quinlan rushed forward. Voss and Asajj spun around Plo, who ran down the middle, and this move caught Sidious cross-footed. He twisted his ankle and flipped back to defend himself. Skywalker caught Dooku on the ground, and he tapped into everything Asajj taught him. He controlled the dark side and pressed Dooku back, shoving him further and further until Magna Guards dropped down behind him and jabbed him back with their electric staffs. Skywalker winced in pain, but he did not stop. Electricity covered his body and he used it as power, as he drove his blade through Dooku's chest before turning back and using the force to crush the droids. Anakin looked back over and rushed Sidious. Asajj leapt up and Quinlan struck low. Plo used all of his power in the middle and shoved Sidious backwards. Skywalker was able to move up behind the Dark Lord and thrust his blade through his back. Anakin twisted his body to the side because Ventress and Quinlan jabbed their blades forward too, which both went through Palpatine's body. The Sith were gone. It was a victory. They did it, and they couldn't believe it. But as the three of them were looking at the dead Sith, Anakin ran over to Obi-Wan, who was still alive. The Jedi Master held his student's hands and told him that Qui-Gon was right. He did bring balance to the Force. Skywalker held him and begged him not to go, but Obi-Wan smiled and told him he'd be alright. He could rest peacefully now. Anakin was safe, and the galaxy would find its hope once again. He held Anakin's hand and told him that the balance would be maintained for as long as he lived. Then with what he had left, he told Anakin to pass on everything he had learned. Plo, Asajj, and Quinlan walked up and placed their hands on Anakin's shoulders and on his back, as Obi-Wan became one with the Force. The revelation of Palpatine was clear as day, and there'd be no explanation that any of his loyalists could concoct to try and rationalize what they were able to see. 
There were security recordings from the castle that showed everything. Dooku and Palpatine were gone, and the war came crashing to a close. The truth was supposed to be what set you free, but the burden it left on the Republic was one that made everyone reconsider everything. A burden that had them looking back to a chancellor from the golden era of the Republic. Lessons and ideals that could be used to lead the Republic out of this time of war. A period that could become an enlightened and purified one. A period that would take the entire generation of senators to fix. Skywalker would be heartbroken, but he would maintain the promise he made to Obi-Wan. Plo would suggest that Obi-Wan's seat go to Skywalker and that he be given the role of Master. It was accepted by the Collective Council. They believed it was the right decision, especially for Anakin's diligence in the face of adversity. Kenobi would be buried inside the Jedi Temple, but after Anakin and Ahsoka killed Maul on Mandalore, what remained of him would be buried with Duchess Satine, so that they could forever have a place with each other. Quinlan and Asajj went around the galaxy on their own, living a life free from the Order, and while the allure to that way of life almost pulled Anakin in, he realized that his time with the Order is what he made of it. He now had his twins, but he also had an entire order to bestow knowledge onto. He believed that him staying with the Jedi would be the best decision he could make. Just as Obi-Wan's master had done to him, Obi-Wan did to his student. Passing on the eternal burden of ensuring light was restored to the galaxy. While Asajj would never find herself inside the Jedi Order, her friendship with Skywalker was one that would last an entire lifetime. For Ventress, having two emotionally strong people in her life was everything. Skywalker was a friend or brother she always needed and Quinlan was a partner she always desired. Her peace of mind would accompany the newfound peace that would take over the entire galaxy. The war had changed a lot, but the result of such change were people better from the challenges they overcame. Because just like Skywalker, Ventress, and Voss, the galaxy would find balance in a new era founded by fulfillment and in greatness. And that, my friends, is our story. Again, special thanks to Benjamin Wells, Jane Effect Clone, Ben Ingram, The Big Red Pure Mark, Diamond Constant, Dark Nemesis, Lord Tib, CC2024, Galvin Gaming, Tristan, Mandalore, Sir William1767, Darth Revan, Grandity Bane, Laliant, Sky Guy, Penguin, Cullen Rooney, Shark Midori, RJ38, Nick, Michael Erlanger, The Last Jedi, Apollo, We Was 670, Anakin Stank Runner, CT7567, Toaster Oven, Oz of Oz, Darth Knock, The Eternal Padawan, Joshua Tem, Jenna Daguin, Zeth Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Lord Cali, Galen 66 Mammoth Studios, Anakin 003, Lord Dragon, Four Six Lake Star Wars, Airbus, Rex Wolf, Man Three First Names, Dark Saint 46, Baron Joshua, and Then Wing for supporting the channel, smash that like button. If you want to support me other ways, go check out the Patreon. Super cool things on there. Otherwise, let's talk about today's story. Working with Asajj is always super fun. She's a very interesting character, and she's always like dealing with this like deep dread and, and conflicting emotions. And so having a scenario after Ahsoka leaves where she and Anakin develop like a, an alliance. It's felt really interesting to do, and I feel like it's a relationship that would start in revenge, but it would end in companionship, balance, and fulfillment. One where they're not seeking revenge for the wrongs that were done to them, but actually one where they're able to come out on the other side as better individuals with balance and fulfillment, as was said. So I hope you all enjoyed, I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the Force be with you.